Hi everyone, I am Nicole Endicott doing another IEA Virtual Learning Lab. Uh, I'm a program coordinator with IEA for the Labs program, for the Academy program, and I'm excited to be leading these virtual learning labs as well. Today we'll be talking about marine mammals. It's a little fun to think about being by the ocean or being by the beach, so if you can kind of picture as we go along that you're doing some sort of ocean activity, uh, that, can, that can help. All right, first and foremost, what is a mammal? So I've put a few of my favorites on the right here. I have a dog uh, in the picture and also in real life, I have a dog. Well, I have a picture of a panda, a cheetah, and a bat. And all of these mammals and every other mammal you can think of have a few things in common with just a couple exceptions. The first is that they all have fur or hair. Even the marine mammals we'll be talking about all have some sort of fur or hair, even if it isn't you know, even if you don't think of them as being fuzzy or furry. The second is that the females produce milk. The third is that they give birth to live young. They don't lay eggs. And this is the one with some exceptions, which you might already know about. We'll talk about those in a minute. They are all warm-blooded, or in other words, they control their own body heat. They metabolize to warm themselves. They don't have to be like snakes or other reptiles that have to lay in the sun and change their environment to change their temperature. They do that. They maintain their temperature more consistently by metabolizing the food that they eat and things like that. And the fifth is that they're all vertebrates. They all have a backbone. Okay, so let's look at those exceptions. This is the duckbill platypus and the um, spiny echidna. And both of these are mammals that also lay eggs. So that's pretty crazy. Um, you can read more about them if you're interested. But now let's turn our focus to marine mammals. Here are a bunch of marine mammals in uh, this collage here. And marine mammals are going to have to have some special adaptations. If we put you out into the ocean right now, or me, or any human, or any other land animal, we would have a hard time surviving and succeeding out there in the ocean. So Take a minute and think about what the hardest things might be if you were just plopped down in the ocean. What are the things that you would need the most? And then we'll look at what these marine mammals have in order to um, conquer those obstacles and actually do really well in, in the face of those. What we see as challenges, what they see as just their normal life. One of the first ones I would think of is staying warm. It's cold out there in the ocean, especially if you live somewhere icy. Um, even if it is snow, it's still considered water. So for example, we'll get there, but um, walruses and even polar bears are considered marine mammals because they live most of their life on ice. Um, the animal on the left is a sea otter and they are known for having the thickest fur of any mammal. They have over a million squares per square, or a million hairs per square inch of fur. It's so thick and it sort of like a wetsuit or dry suit. It holds a layer of air in around their skin that keeps them warm. And then we have animals like the walrus on the right, and they use blubber. A lot of whales do this as well. That's fat that insulates in the animal and keeps them nice and cozy. Next, they might have adaptations to dive deeply. A lot of them feed on fish and squid and things like that that are going to be deep down in the ocean. And I can't dive very deeply at all. Um, some of you might have me beat there. But a lot of these whales and seals and dolphins are going to be really good at diving deeply. They have a few different things that help them do that. They have really big lungs. They have actually a flexible uh, rib cage that their lungs can expand really, really big. They also have a better system than we do for carrying oxygen in their blood. And a few other things as well. They're really good at kind of um, being efficient with their energy so that they can make a little bit of oxygen last longer than we do. We're just breathing all the time. These guys can hold their breath. It's important to remember that they do, because they're mammals, they do still have lungs and they do still breathe air. They don't have gills. They, don't, um, they can't breathe underwater but they can hold their breath for a really long time. And then they also need adaptations to swim well. I, you know, I can swim, but I can't swim to maybe escape a shark, or I probably can't swim 
to catch my own food. So a lot of marine mammals are gonna have flippers and fins and tails and dorsal fins and really aerodynamic shape that help them just glide through the water and um, swim really well. And then they also need adaptations to see underwater. My eyes get really red and blurry when I try to open them underwater, especially in the salty, salty ocean. Uh, so a lot of marine mammals, or in fact, almost all of them, are going to have a special membrane in between their eyes and the water that sort of acts like a pair of goggles. Except they don't get the, the red marks from wearing them like we do. Now let's look at classification. So I'm gonna go through a few of the categories. It might be helpful if you already know a little bit about um, phyla and genus and species and orders and families, but it isn't necessary. So if you're interested in classification and ta taxonomy, you can maybe look up a, a video or list of what those categories are, but either way, you will be able to follow along just fine. And the main piece of information um, is we'll be talking about orders that are then broken into families. But I'm, for the most part, I won't be saying what the level of classification for these are because a lot of them have suborders and sub suborders and all sort of sorts of things that make it sound more complicated than it is. First, let's look at the pinnipeds. And th these are within the order carnivora. So uh, as you can imagine, that means carnivores. And the three main categories of pinnipeds, which means featherfoot, are walruses, oops, it's supposed to say sea lions, and seals. So these all have flippers, that's why they're called the featherfoot, and there's walruses, sea lions, and seals. And a lot of people get mixed up between the difference between sea lions and seals, so let's take a look at that. The left is a seal and the right is a sea lion. So just for a minute, look at the differences, kind of make a mental note. Some of you might already know this. Some of them can't really be seen in a picture anyway. But the biggest and most noticeable is that the sea lion can go up on its elbows and the seal cannot. The seal moves on land by just kind of blobbing along the sand or the rocks. It can't really go up on its elbows like the sea lion can. It can't scooch itself forward. Um, a lot of times people talk about, oh, the seals that, that can balance uh, a ball on their nose and then they bark and they go, arr, arr, arr. that's actually always a sea lion. So if people are talking about that classic image of a seal, quote unquote, with a ball on its nose, barking at a circus, that's actually always a sea lion. And that is A, because seals can't go up on their elbows, and B, because seals actually don't make noise. All they really do is snuffle and sniff and make sort of grunting sounds. Sea lions are gonna be the ones that are really loud under the pier that you can hear on the boats offshore, talking mostly to my fellow Californians. Um, and that's the main difference. The, the last difference that's the most um, visually obvious is the ears. So sea lions have little ear flaps and seals do not, they just have holes. Next we have our adorable friends, the sea otters. They are also part of carnivora. They are their own categories. Um, they are really intelligent. You might have heard about them being able to collect rocks and break open clams and sea urchins with the rocks. It's kind of fun to see. They're also very social, so they have social groups like you can see here. And then like I mentioned earlier, polar bears are also considered marine mammals by most people because even though they don't live their life underwater, they do live their life on ice, which is frozen water. And they are also part of carnivora. They are very much so carnivores. They love their fish and anything they can get their, get their paws on. Okay, let's get into cetacea. So cetacea is the whales, the whales and the dolphins. Um, actually, the whales <laughs> and then all dolphins are whales. We'll get in more into that in just a minute, but 
um, cetacea is for the whales and all dolphins and porpoises are within the whale category. There are two main, main categories of cetacea and they're both kind of fun words. The first one is odontocete and the second one is mysticete. Those of you who have been to the orthodontist or hopefully all of you have been to the dentist, you might recognize uh, one of the root words in odontoceti means teeth. And so those are the toothed whales. Those are whales and dolphins and porpoises that have teeth. And then mysticeti, those all have baleen, which is uh, like in Finding Nemo when Marlin and Dory get trapped in the whale and they see kind of the big like comb coming through and they have to jump out. Part of that is accurate that, that some whales, the biggest ones especially, do have baleen for sifting things out, but there's no way they would come out the blowhole at the end. So we'll have to uh, just suspend disbelief on that one. Here are a few more comparisons between Odontocete and Mysticete. I will move my video. Uh, so Odontocete, they have teeth. Mysticete, baleen. The toothed whales have one blowhole, which you can see on the top in the dolphin picture. And Mysticete actually has two blowholes. It's sort of like we have two nostrils in our nose. It's weird to think about. But when you see their spouts, you can kind of tell the difference. It, there's um, spew more in two directions. And then if you've heard about whales and dolphins doing sonar, uh, where they can kind of make sounds through the water and hear where their prey is, that uh, is only going to be the toothed whales. Mysticeti cannot do that. The toothed whales includes belugas and narwhals, sperm whales, beaked whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Mysticeti includes the workwhals, which is a very hard word to say, but those are the whales with the big kind of pleated throats, uh, like humpbacks and blue whales. And then it also includes the right whales, which are ones with just giant heads compared to the rest of their body. You can look up a picture. And uh, then the gray whales are their own category. Okay, also let's clarify porpoises versus dolphins. So a porpoise is on the left and a dolphin is on the right. The biggest difference is in their beaks. Porpoises have really round heads with just a little beak sticking out in front. Dolphins have a pretty long beak. And then if you look a little closer, you can also tell that they have fairly different teeth. Porpoises have sort of like cylinder teeth that aren't as sharp and dolphins have really conical sharp teeth. Last but not least, not least, we have our friends the manatees and dugongs, also called the sea cows. These are the only category of marine mammals that are purely vegetarian. So they are not even omnivores. They eat all grass and algae and other sea plants. And you might have heard, you probably have heard of manatees, but you might not have heard of dugongs. Uh, you can look at for the difference in their tails. So manatees are on the top. They have kind of a paddle tail. And dugongs have uh, a more classic whale tail. They are on the bottom. And you'll notice their um, category name is called Serenia. Those of you who have read the Odyssey or know some mythology might know about the sirens, which are sort of tied in with our mythology about mermaids. It is thought that one possibility for where the myth of mermaids originated is from sailors seeing manatees or dugongs um, off the side of their ships, hence the name Serenia. But uh, I think it's probably more likely of the two going to be the dugongs because their tail is so much more similar to what we think of as a mermaid tail. Okay, let's play a little game. It's called Who's More Related? So I'm going to show some pictures and based on what we just talked about, about classification, uh, you'll pick two that are the most related of any pair in the um, group. All right, we have dolphins, um, they're bottlenose dolphins. 
we have a humpback whale, we have a great white shark, and we have an orca or killer whale. So two of these are fairly closely related and the other two are more distant. Okay, here we go. Let's see who it is. So the dolphin and the orca are the most closely related. Orcas and the bottlenose dolphins are both part of the toothed whale dolphin category, odontocete. And for the great white shark, that isn't even a mammal, so it shouldn't even belong in this, in this um, presentation. And the humpback whale is a whale, it's in cetacea, but it's a baleen whale, so it's in mysticity. Ooh, here's another one that doesn't belong, but I might be trying to trick you. Let's take a look. So we have a cat, we have a porpoise, and we have a sea otter, a very cute sea otter. So think for a minute about which two are the most related. Yeah, so it's gonna be the cat and the otter. They are both in carnivora. This porpoise is in cetacea, even though you know we could talk about a million other similarities between the porpoise and the otter that make them similar, maybe their lifestyle in terms of taxonomy and classification of the, the animal itself, the species itself. The cat and the otter are actually more related than the two marine animals. All right, um, that one is one that's really fun. If you just kind of pull up a picture of a general ocean scene, you can kind of find some like quote unquote cousins and find some that would be different. Okay, one more, and I don't expect you to know these already um, with one exception, uh, and, but it's, it's gonna be fun to look at some scientific names and then you at home can try to guess which uh, animal these scientific names go with. Hmm, Orcanus orca, what could that possibly go, go with? What could that possibly represent? Well, I started you off with an easy one because orca, orca whale, killer whale is correct. This one they took a fairly literal name <laughs> for. Uh, Orcanus orca is a scientific name for the orca. Uh, this one in this picture is doing something that's called spy hopping, which is a behavior they, they're still studying. They don't know exactly why they do it, but where they just kind of stick their heads straight up out of the water without making much of a splash, look around and slide back down. Kind of makes you want to tell them that even though they're trying, maybe trying to be sneaky, they're still a giant whale, so it's a little bit hard to be sneaky. Uh, they're just sneaking up out of the water with their giant whale heads, sliding back down. That's called spy hopping. Ooh, this one, Megaptera novangelae. That is a mouthful, but try to look for maybe some words, especially in the first word, the genus, that you might have uh, some roots that you might recognize, maybe even from a dinosaur. This Terra here has the P at the beginning as well, sort of like pterodactyl, which means wing. Of course, none of the animals we talked about have wings, but there is one that has really, really, really huge fins that sort of look like wings. And that's the humpback whale. They have these really long fins um, and megaptera means big wing. And then the second part is kind of not helpful. It's just because it was discovered in New England. Okay, last one, Balenoptera musculus. So look for, again, some words you recognize. There's the Terra again. So it's gonna be one with fins. You might know what this first part means, Baleen, and then musculus. So this is the blue whale, the largest living thing. Uh, it means baleen, and wings, the fins, and then musculus uh, means muscular. But what's funny is that there's another animal that has the same, that same species name, different genus, of course, that is 
pretty much the exact opposite of a blue whale. So remember, blue whale, largest living thing. Moose musculus is a mouse. So I think it's kind of funny that, of course, there are very, very different genuses and orders and everything. Actually, yeah, on orders. But blue whale, largest thing, tiny little mouse, same species name, musculus. All right, speaking of size, here is an activity that you can do uh, once this video is over to sort of get to know marine mammal size a little bit better. That will involve measuring. You can maybe even go outside and make some marks on the sidewalk with some chalk or um, whatever you have around to mark the size of these different things. Um, you can use, for, especially for the blue whale, 80 feet, you're gonna need to double up a double or even triple up uh, your tape measure. But look at this huge size disparity and range of sizes in marine mammals. Harbor seal, five feet, all the way up to blue whale, 80 feet. And again, not every single blue whale is gonna be 80 feet, but I took kind of the middle of the range for all of these. Um, and you are welcome to look up any other of your favorites and see where they fit into this range. But I thought I'd start, start you with seven, and you can go from there, have fun measuring. And let us know, as always, if there are any videos or topics that you would like IEA to explain for you. Hopefully we can all go to the beach again soon, maybe even see some whales. In the meantime, there are a lot of fun aquarium live streams that you can check out and even some ocean live streams. So take a look at those online and uh, we hope to hear from you. Stay safe out there.